Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and welcome to a live stream on Bob the Science Guy's channel. Let's go ahead and get some very basic things done here first. Let's make sure that the uh, stream is working properly. So if you guys would, let me know how the audio is and uh, tell me whether or not things are... Uh... Oh, stop that. Tell me whether or not things are working fine while I get everything all set up here. Now, for those of you interested, we actually have a, um, we've got a live, we've got a live discord going on the other channel. There we go. And you can join into that. The link to that is in the description. I want to make sure that the closed captions and everything are working fine. And I want to make sure the audio is good. So let's go see. Let me get over to the watch page. Make sure that everything's working just fine. Got 37 people out there already. That's pretty good. Yep, so the sound's good. We've got the pictures are nice and clear. Everything's looking good here. Now, let me tell you what I want to do today. Yesterday, I stopped by Nathan Oakley's channel to give him a challenge because, as you know, what's going on here? We don't need that yet. Let's go ahead and make that smaller. That did it all on its own. I must have accidentally hit something. All right, so let me go ahead and pull this bad boy up. Uh, just a couple minutes. This is the joy of doing this live. All right, so we've got old Nathan here. And I chased him down to his own channel the other day, basically because what I wanted to do was I wanted to kind of expose him, he and his crew a little bit. For the last couple of months, they've been going on and on about sextants, and, you know, Adam Meekins comes out says he's ordered nine books on sextants. And Mitchell and Brian's Logic are putting out things on sextants. So what I did was I popped in to his channel and I gave him a little cha uh, challenge. One that came to me from MC Tune, my, my friend out in Minnesota. And basically he was doing a sextant challenge between Fight the Flat Earth and some flat earther. Uh, and he had sextant readings that he wanted them to go ahead and give a location or a position of the ship based on the sextant readings. And what he did was he sent me one of the readings beforehand to see whether or not I could do it. And it was something that people could do. And this is the one that I did. So here's what we have. All right. It's a sample challenge. This is a boat that is within, oh, bless it. This is a boat that is within 1,200 nautical miles of the islands of Hawaii. So that kind of give you, gives you the very basic uh, information on where this ship is. And it's a two-star fix. And that basic information on the location of the boat is very important because it, it excludes one of, the possible, one of the two possible locations of the boat. Good morning, Round Thinker. Greetings from Israel. And well, greetings from Northern Michigan. So here we have a two-star fix. The first star is Capella. The time is 7.55 and 12 seconds in July 21st, 1982. Now this is local time and it was specified as being local time and that is 14.55 and 12 seconds GMT. The second star is going to be Vega and it was done about 20 minutes later 
And you can see the sextant readings that resulted from both of those sites. And he then very clearly states that he's no more than 1,200 miles from Hawaii. He's nine feet above the water. He's got the time zone so you can figure out GM, GMT. And he's got the index error of the instrument. Um, that would be, these are the standard corrections that you have to make to a sextant reading. And of course, those are raw sextant readings. The other thing is that he gives the actual course and speed of the boat, because this is important. When you get that first sextant reading, it'll give you a line of position for the boat at that time. Well, a couple of minutes later, you're going to take a second reading, and it'll give you a line of position for that. However, the boat's moved in between. Now, it hasn't moved far. In 20 minutes, at 7 knots, you're looking at about 2 miles or 2 minutes of angle difference. And that's not really bad. But the thing about it is, is that I wanted to see whether or not Nathan or any of his band of idiots could take an actual sextant reading and give me a position on a boat. So let's have a listen to it real quick. Now I'm going to get on out of here and I'm going to turn my mic off for a minute. I'm going to pay a little bit more attention to the chat. We've got 72 people in there already, 16 likes. Don't see any dislikes, but if you'll hit it one way or the other, I'd appreciate it. So let's have a quick listen to it. Remember, you have to be a subscriber to the channel for five minutes before you can post in the live feed, but you can go over to the Discord anytime you want. Now let's make sure that we've got this... That's actually pretty close, Ion. Well, actually, you know, just to let you guys know, Ion was one of the other people that did it. And um, he calculated it out. Now, when we first did it, uh, and when MC sent this to us, we got approximately 14 miles off. So let's go see whether or not we're getting, uh, getting a signal out. I want to make sure that the live stream is playing. And it Just based on spherical trigonometry works. Started. I just want to make sure that everything is working fine and we've got the system audio on. Let's go ahead and test that out before I get out of here. <laughs> yep. Hey, hey Nathan, here. how are you? Hello, Bob. How are you doing? Looks like it might be a little... Hey, I've got a sextant challenge for you in the timeout nice. chat. Can any of you tell me my position? Can any of you tell you me my position attention? from those two sites? I solved it in less than five minutes. So you've got all your sextant geniuses in there right now. Go ahead and tell me where that position is. Why? Well, well, it's, uh, hold on, hold on. I, I don't mind to challenge. Will it prove a ball? It'll prove that celestial navigation, which is based on spherical trigonometry, works. So think, go ahead on. and solve it. Hold on. Your claim is that if we do this challenge, it will prove that... The trig being used is spherical, correct? You seem hesitant to just confirm the thing you've said Nathan, 20 you seconds can, ago. Nathan, you can either solve the uh, problem Sorry, or you can't. Hello, right ahead hello. Give me a position. Hello, Latitude hello, longitude. hello. Clarifying your claim. Seem a bit hesitant to just clarify the thing you said 25 seconds ago. So you're saying that in order to solve this problem, it will require spherical trig, therefore proving a sphere if, we do, if they do the challenge or I do the challenge. Is that what you're saying, yes or no? Use what you said about 40 seconds ago. Go ahead and give me the uh, latitude and longitude. No, the go ahead and... Answer. Sorry, what is your malfunction? Yes, I will do that. As soon as you confirm what you have said about a minute ago, and we are stepping further away by you demanding that we do this, regardless of the clarification, it will prove a sphere by your declaration that it will require spherical trig to do it. Is that correct? You stated that about a minute ago. Are you denying That's it now or it not? Works, Nathan. But you're more than welcome to use flatter trig to do it. More than Go welcome? Do it Sorry, which will we now. need to yep. use? Okay, now oh, we've got a bit, now we've got a bit further. Now we've got a bit further. We're welcome to use flat earth trig. But which yep. one works? Does it work using spherical triangles or does it work with there's no normal you seem to be interrupting me before i get to the end of my question to clarify your challenge are you scared of us clarifying your challenge does it just
Okay, now what I want to do is I want to point out a few of the techniques that he's using so far. First of all, he's trying to take control of this, and uh, it's not working because I'm not letting him do it. Boy, I went blurry there real quick, didn't I? Let's see if that fix. If not, I will in a second. Uh, but now he's trying to he's trying to put all sorts of questions out there that are completely unnecessary, of course, for the simple reason that my my challenge is very very clear. All right, I don't think anybody that listened to this has any question whatsoever what the challenge is. You're going to take these coordinates right there, and you're going to find a position of a ship. Simple as that. It's a very basic navigation exercise. You don't need to know whether or not I want you to use spherical or flat earth trigonometry. You can use whatever you want as long as you get the correct position of the ship, which is known. So all of this, you know, Nathan, Nathan is very scared at this point because I, I came on his show I actually put out a challenge that he allowed me to put out to his detriment and now he's stuck. Now he has to put up or shut up. And he's got all of his little band of idiots out there. He's got Adam Meekins. He's got Brian's Logic. He's got a whole host of people out there that supposedly can help him that know so that were actually actively giving a presentation on the sextant when I came in. So always, always a good time. the case that you lay down the challenge we must do it and there's no clarification to what it'll prove in between we're just clarifying what you think it'll prove you're saying we're welcome to use flat earth trick which one will actually get you a result though will we have to use spherical trick to get the right result bob nathan it's going to demonstrate whether or not you can actually read a sextant hear that and quiver in his voice that's the sound of a man that knows he's fucked that little quiver in his voice. Did you hear it, ladies and gentlemen? Nathan, go right yeah. ahead and just demonstrate yeah, that you that's a man scared of me. I know I make you shit your pants, Bob. I'm going to ask a third time, and you can either run or clarify that which you have already claimed, that we will require spherical trig to do this. Will we or won't we? Absolutely. Okay, so you believe that the triangle we will be acquiring the GP of the star to will be done off a curved adjacent then. You seem to be interrupting me before the end of my question. Again, I'll repeat it. So I when measuring, anything, he's interrupting me for a second time at the start of the question rather than the end this time. I'll try a third time. He seems well, very scared. That's the fourth you know, interruption. Obviously word. terrified of me repeating the question, which is to acquire the GP of the star. We will be doing it with a curved adjacent then, won't we, Bob? What adjacent? the one that measures along the ground, the baseline to the GP. That's going to be a curved line, isn't it? Spherical, right? On a spherical surface, spherical trig, curved, adjacent. Right, Bob? You have to have a triangle to have an adjacent. Sorry, a triangle or There's a spherical, no triangle. curved triangle. You said we're going to be using spherical trig. There's so no this triangles. So this baseline, which is it? Curved, adjacent, or? There's no adjacent. No adjacent? No, there's no triangle. You That's a very high pitch, no. An adjacent. No triangle? You said we could no, use the flat... No sorry, a moment ago we could use flat earth trig. Now there's no triangle to use. You seem confused. I'm not confused. If so there is a triangle, and that triangle's got a right angle. It's a flat baseline. But I'm asking you, who says it can be done with spherical trig, if it can actually yeah. be done with a curved adjacent. There's no adjacent. No adjacent. Yep, so when you said you can do it with flat earth trig, what did you mean precisely? Because you're now saying there's no adjacent. Of course. I'm not getting an echo or anything, am I? Everything's sounding pretty good out there? Yep, this is pumpkin pie. Uh, got a question for you guys. Oh, come on. Okay, so here's pumpkin pie. 
This is a slice of nice, delicious pumpkin pie. Now, I've got a question for everybody out in the audience. Is this crust of the pumpkin pie curved? And the reason that I ask that is if you have a curved side to a triangle and two straight sides, is that a triangle in the flat earth world? I would say no, because there's a curved line on it, because according to them, triangles have to be, have to be made up of straight lines. All right, so Lone Tech, you had a question. I think you had a question. Go ahead and type it in real quick so we can get it. And I'm gonna continue on with what I'm doing right now. And while I wait for your question to come in. Now, here's my point. Even though this is clearly not a triangle because it has a curved side, that's an angle right there, isn't it? Does that angle have a sine, a cosine, a tangent? Does it have a secant or a cotangent or a cosecant? Could you actually do a versine or a sagitta from that? If you measured the curve of that edge, could you find out how big the pie was originally? Now, this is the point that he seems to have a little bit of trouble with, because I, I kid you not, he's going to say that you can't use trigonometry unless you're directly dealing with a triangle. Now, unfortunately, he's wrong with that because we use trigonometry all the time. Trigonometry is indeed the study of triangles, as I recall from my mathematics classes when I was, in the, when I was 12 in the seventh grade. However, I seem to have progressed a little bit since then. And I realized that things like sines and cosines can be used in statistics where there are no triangles involved. We can use tangents we can do all sorts of things with trigonometric functions that don't directly involve a triangle. So let's go ahead and have a listen to him a little bit more and see what he has to say. So we'll bring this back over here. And I don't think that we need anything else on that, but I'm gonna go ahead and click on this and we're gonna listen a little bit more because this is kind of fun. Let me go ahead and kill my mic so we don't get feedback. This is not an adjacent, you're just measuring it. There's no adjacent. Just one more time, let's hear it from Bob the Science Guy. There is no adjacent when measuring an angle. No, there's no adjacent. There's no adjacent when measuring an angle. Nope, gotta have a triangle for that. A triangle? Uh, right. Hey, yeah, you, you have to have a triangle to No adjacent. Angular distance. Well, you have to minus yep. that from 90 to get it onto the ground to travel the distance. No, you're measuring the angular distance between a star and a point on the horizon. A point on the That's horizon? All right. so, Are you going to do it? Sorry, the point on the horizon. Try and play sorry, Bob, game. stop. I've got about 10 right, quotes well, of you saying the horizon's not needed on QE's channel. It was trimmed out by YouTube also. Shout out to you. Go ahead. Saying the go ahead there's, and there's, there's solve it or... or All right, so here's another technique that, that Nathan likes to use. I have 10 quotes of you saying that a horizon is not needed to do a sextant reading. Absolutely correct. You don't have to use a horizon for a sextant reading. In fact, right here is the bubble sextant. This doesn't use a horizon at all. What this does is it uses gravity to float a bubble to the middle of a circular chamber. And then what you do is you either look through the eyepiece or you look directly through the sextant. You look directly through the sextant up at the star. And then you can adjust a reflect or a piece of glass in there, which will reflect the bubble. And you put the star in the center of the bubble. And then you just read the angle right down here. This is actually not a sextant. It's an octant. There was some question about that. Now, what else do we have? I'm very pleased to announce that 2022 is going to be the year of the astrolabe. 
This is an astrolabe. It's eight inches in diameter. It weighs about a kilo. Simply by suspending it from this ring right here, we establish a vertical line. And then we can take this, this ruler right here and actually get an angle to a star or to the sun or to a tall building if we want to measure the height of the building. Now, here is an interesting photo that I think you guys, that, that I think will probably bring an awful lot of information to you to show you exactly where his misunderstanding is. Let me go ahead and pull that up. And it's right here. This is something called a mill dot site. Now, I used this last night on his Discord, and I think that some lights went on into some of the some of the folks there. You have a man out here who we're going to assume is whatever height he is. We're not that's not really important just yet. The important thing is these dots in the in the telescopic site. These dots are set one mil apart or 3.6 minutes of angle. The way that's set up is that at a thousand yards, the separation between those dots is 36 inches or three feet. At a thousand meters, the separation between the dots is one meter. So we can actually look at the angular size of this man and we see that he is one, two, three, almost four mil dots high. All right. That means that his, the range to him, assuming he's six feet tall, is going to be a little bit more than 500 yards. However, more importantly, look right here. We can also tell that he is one mil dot wide. So here's my question for you, Nathan. Where is the adjacent in this angle? Because what we're doing is we're just simply measuring two lines coming together and forming an angle. In order to have an adjacent, you need to have an opposite. That's kind of the whole purpose of calling it an adjacent. And he seems to have missed that in his primary school education. And that seems to be where most of these folks stop their education is in primary school. Now, I think there may be one more image right here. Right here, this one. This is an excellent image from Scott Manley, who did a video a while ago demonstrating how to find the parallax in the distance to the moon from observers on Earth. <coughs> now, here's the way it's done. We've got three objects here. And, you know, it's Jupiter, it's Saturn, and it's a bright star. And by simply taking a photograph of those, we can measure the angular separation between these two stars, between these two stars, and between these two stars, simply by counting pixels and looking up on the astronomical tables or Stellarium, what the angular separation of those two stars are, those two objects are. And then we can find out how many arc seconds per pixel, for example. And then what we can do is we can actually look at this image right here. Let me get out of your way because this is the key image of this photograph. And that's right here. Notice that that's a moon and there's a second moon superimposed on it. So what this image came from was that Scott Manley, I guess, was up in the San Francisco area and he had one of his subscribers take a picture of the moon at exactly the same time he did. And that second subscriber was down in Rio de Janeiro. And then what they did was they took the photographs and they rotated them and scaled them so that these three stars lined up perfectly. And what he did then was he demonstrated the parallax of the moon. So he went from the center of this moon to the center of that moon counted the number of pixels in that, in that image between those two center points. And then by using that distance and the known, di and, the mo known and measured distance 
between the two observers, Rio de Janeiro and San Francisco, they were able to use what's called the parallax equation, and they were able to find the distance to the moon. And they did a pretty good job with it. I think they got 34 or 3,000 or 340,000 kilometers roughly. And I think that the actual distance to the moon is something like 3,000 or 30. Bleh, did it again. You know, I'll tell you, sometimes you just have one of those boomer moments. You can, you know what to say up here, but you just can't make your mouth say it. So we had, the actual distance to the moon is something like 348,400 kilometers. So he really wasn't all that far off. And that's not bad for the type of equipment that he was using. Remember, in order to see the stars, you have to massively overexpose the moon. And you get a lot of flare with that. But if you look very carefully on this image, you can actually see the rim of the unlit moon that only is illuminated by Earthshine. And you can see that in both images. So what he did was he went, he went from the edge to the edge to get a little better measurement. But there are better ways of doing this, but this is actually not a bad way that any of us can do, you know, simply by taking a picture of the moon and comparing it to a picture taken at exactly the same time by a friend of ours on the other side of the country or the other side of the continent. So this is the point that's being made right here. Sextants do not measure triangles. They measure the angular separation between two objects. And those objects would include such things as the top and bottom of somebody's head. So let's go ahead and do that again. So right here, We're simply measuring the angular difference, you know, the angular separation between this gentleman's feet and the top of his head. We're also measuring it side to side. So perhaps if you don't, the reason that I bring this up is that side to side measurement has absolutely nothing to do with the ground underneath it. The distance, the angular distance between those stars and the centers of the moon have nothing to do with any surface underneath them. There's simply an angular separation in an image. So this is the point that Nathan is terrified of. And once again, he's trying to bring up this nonsense about a curved adjacent. Again, what adjacent? What was the adjacent on that mill dot picture? Was the adjacent the side that was towards his feet or his head or the front or the back of him? Which was the adjacent? You need to have a triangle to have an adjacent, don't you, Nathan? So, let's go ahead and continue this. So why is he chanting through me? I don't get it. What's wrong? Why is he chanting through me? I'm clarifying that you specifically on this show told us you don't need the horizon. What's going on? He said he, he, said he doesn't need a triangle. I oh, know. But then he said he uses spherical trick. Hey, Bob! Define trigonometry. I'll wait for you to solve it, Nathan. Define trigonometry, Bob. We're clarifying what this proves and whether or not you can actually do it with spherical trig when we're measuring flat baselines and it doesn't have a curved adjacent. When I said that, you said we don't have an adjacent. Then you went on to deny we even need a triangle. Now we have Quantum Eraser coming in. Now let's go ahead and have a look at the dynamics of these two here. I don't know if any of you saw the Fluorspective expose on, on Nathan Oakley the other day. It's a really telling insight. Nathan is a failed actor, and he was wandering from conspiracy theory to conspiracy theory and tried to figure out a way to make money on YouTube to support his family. Now I don't fault somebody for getting paid for their, their craft. He's an actor. He gets paid for being an actor. But he came, you know, he went through several different iterations of a YouTube show and then finally settled on Flat Earth back in about 2016 at the height of the Flat Earth craze. And he's been kind of locked into it ever since. Uh, he knows that the Earth is a sphere as much as I do. I mean, there's absolutely no question about that. He is not a dumb person. He's quite intelligent. You can tell that by listening 
to the way he crafts his arguments, the way he tries and slyly puts things in according to his script that he developed over many, many shows. I think he's up to 1,500 of them now. But he's very good at arguing. And this is a characteristic that Robotham had as well. He was not a very intelligent person, but he was very good at arguing and picking up on small nuances. Notice that Nathan's already done that uh, by trying to claim that, well, on previous episodes I said you don't need a horizon to get a sextant reading. Well, you don't. You can get an indirect sextant reading with a pan of water. You can get a bubble sextant reading that determines the vertical rather than the horizontal directly. However, if you have the horizon, there's nobody that says you can't use it. You look at a spot on the horizon and you look at the angular separation between that spot and your star. No big deal. There's no adjacent because there's no triangle. You're simply looking at the angular separation between two objects. Well, he's pretty much stuck right now. And as a result, he brought in a quantum racer to disrupt the conversation. Notice I'm not buying it, but he comes right in. He's immediately attacking. He's demanding definitions that I really don't bother with. Now, he accused me of having him on mute. As you can see, he's not on mute. He's just being ignored. I don't respond to children. So let's go ahead and have a listen to this. And again, although Quantum Eraser puts himself off as a, as a fundamental Christian, you know, an officer and a gentleman, his language and behavior uh, would get him detention on a middle school play yard. So I'm going to warn you in advance that he is a rather vulgar and immature individual. And he's here, his purpose here is not to ask questions or engage in the conversation. His purpose here is to disrupt. So let's go ahead and have a listen to him. First, let's get rid of my mic. Yeah, there's no trial. Like now, you cannot no, no, it proves is that you trig. can or can't solve it. So we're, we're, have at it. There's no triangle, but we're using trig. Define trigonometry, Bob. I can solve this. Sorry, you've Define said there's no trigonometry, triangle. Bob, 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 you told me no adjacent, no triangle. What's trig? <laughs> Correct. Have at it. So what's trig? For the audience's benefit, this dumbfounded silence is what you get when you become a fundamentalist religious zealot chanting about measuring angles on a curved surface. No, actually, what the silence is, is I'm not playing your game. I'm in control of this. You aren't. So I presented you with a challenge. Here are the sextant readings. Go ahead and give me the position of the ship. I'm not going to sit down and answer a bunch of questions on definitions for you because I learned those definitions when I was 12. You should have as well. If you are confused about what trigonometry is, go look it up. Now granted, the Wikipedia page on this, which is written by 12 year olds, talks about trigonometry involving triangles. Well, it does, but not necessarily directly on every measurement. Trigonometry is the, is the mathematics of angles. You use trigonometry, or you use triangles in many cases, to solve trigonometric identities. But the thought of claiming that trigonometry exclusively involves triangles directly is ludicrous. It is 12-year-old mentality, boys. Grow up. You start denying that you're doing triangulation or that you even need triangles or that there's even adjacent that you need at all. That's what you get to. It's trilateration. Do you realize how stupid head. you sound? Do you realize that's how stupid you sound? Define trigonometry. I still sound Define smarter than you, Nathan. Define trigonometry, you dumbass nah, nah, muppet. Nah, nah, nah. Don't use Define trigonometry. Phone a friend, Nathan. Maybe, maybe get phone a friend. Or see if Brian's lost. Phone a friend, you come available. in here. Go ahead and you solve. say spherical trigonometry. You don't know what it is, right? You say you don't need a triangle, but you're using spherical trig. Define trigonometry. 
You're a fucking moron. What's a circle? Seriously, Bob, you've laid out a challenge, but when we come to clarify how it'll prove Sphere Earth, you said we could either use Flat Earth Trig or we could use Spherical Trig. But then you've gone on to deny yeah. triangles. I just, I don't <laughs> get the, I, I, I seriously don't get the mentality that would do this. It's humiliating <laughs> for you. It's, hey, it's, I've got two star readings right there that I was able to do my fuck Hold on, Q, hold on, QE. Just, just butt out just one second. I, I want to know, oh, seriously, what has led you to do this, Bob? You've come Do in and denied the need for... Have ahead. you ever tried to use one? Sorry, is this going to be an ad hom? No, I've never used a sextant. But I understand that you're going to need triangles. The thing you've denied I'm asking you about. You've launched into an ad hominem attack on me. I await your determination of your position with bated breath. All right, Bob. Hey, asswipe. Just yeah, define trigonometry. You denied the need oh, for triangles. Oh, you, you've, while we were in reasonable discussion, Bob, you're like, yeah, you can do it with flat earth trick. Oh, you can, can you? All right. Let's see if we can do it with sphere earth trick. Now we're into denying triangles. And somebody from the panel, QE in this instance, as in his very reasonable way, asked you to just define trig. You're saying either flat earth trig or spherical trig. So, obviously, given that those are the only two choices you've laid down here for us to fulfill your challenge, it seems reasonable that given you've denied that there's a need for a triangle somewhere along this, why you do that, I don't know. It's absolutely insane. But that's what you've done. Now I want you to answer the question on the table. What's trig then? Because I'm confused. Just let me know what the position is. When no, you so, so it's just the demand for us to fulfill your fucking demand, is it, Bob? Do, oh, do, you think, do you think we're subservient to you, Bob? That you're going to come here and lay down some demand that we're going to fulfill because you've just laid it down to us without clarifying like a reasonable man would, what will actually be fulfilled in doing so? All right, I'm going to go ahead and take a moment here real quick. Uh, let's go ahead and go to the chat. What do you think the test is here? Is the test whether or not is the test whether or not the Earth is a sphere? Is the test whether or not we're orbiting the sun or there's gas pressure next to a vacuum? No. It's a very simple test, Nathan. And so far you're failing miserable. The test is can you use you talk a big game about sextants. Down in Texas they call that all hat no cattle. Now you're being now you're being challenged. Here are sextant readings. Tell me where my ship is. That's all I want to know. I don't want any of your crap. I'm not interested in defining words for you that you should have learned in grade school. All right. I want you to tell me where my ship is. That's it. That's the sextant reading. Tell me where I am. Now, if you can do it, I'm going to think that maybe you know something about sextants. If you can't do it, I'm tired of your crap about sextants, talking about them and telling people that actually do know how to use sextants, how they do and don't work. Because quite frankly, that is Dunning-Kruger personified. Because you are absolutely clueless, Nathan. I chased you into your own show to prove in front of your entire audience that you don't have the first clue what you're doing when it comes to celestial or any other type of navigation. Your idea is, well, there are lights in the sky. Well, we know what those lights are. We don't know anything about them. Well, we know their positions and we can find our position looking at them. And I did it. Can you? So let's go on and listen to some more of Nathan's crap here. But first, before we do that, um, let's go ahead and do that, and I want to have a look at the chat here real quick. So we've got a bunch of people out here in the chat. How many people are here today? We've got 138 watching and 68 likes. Make sure you hit those real quick, guys. I really appreciate it. Anybody have any questions in the chat that you would like me? 
uh, to answer directly. Eric, yep, yeah, that's a great that's a great line from an officer and a gentleman. Write write a check with your mouth that you your ass can't cash. That's exactly right. And that's what I'm doing to not only Nathan, who is the ringmaster of this little flat earth circus. Uh, I'm pissing Quantum Eraser off by simply ignoring him, which drives him insane. He's one of these attention hogs. You know, uh, Nathan is a failed actor that found his little niche on YouTube uh, trying to pontificate this nonsense to idiots. You know, the high point of Quantum Eraser's career is adding sugar-free butterscotch pudding to the diabetic diet. All right, that's great. I'm sure those guys really appreciate that. But quite frankly, unless you can show me how to use a sextant, stop talking about it. It's as simple as that. Because I'm tired of your crap. Now, not only does Nathan talk about this all the time, and Quantum Eraser try and correct people that actually know what they're talking about. He is in the middle of a sextant presentation by 10th Man and Adam Meekin and Brian's Logic is in there. All of these people, and the only, the only, the only idiot that they're missing, I think, is Mitchell. Because, you know, of course, it's a different time of day over there, you know, Earth rotation, time zones, you know those things. Now, you should be able to tell me my position based on this information I gave you. I got it. Ion got it. All right. I put a sextant challenge out where I did a, a star or I did a sun reading with both the marine sextant and my bubble sextant. And I put a challenge out, said, okay, well, the first thing is, you know, don't dox me. You know, my, my location, my name and everything are not hidden. But by the same token, that doesn't give you permission to publish it. If you know who I am, that's great. As long as you don't share that with others, me and I don't have a problem. All right. So what I put a, a challenge out is I said, I want, you know, in, in the United States, we have postal codes. We have five digit codes that, you know, we use to route our mail. I want you to use these sextant readings and the time of the sextant reading to tell me what the last two digits of my zip code are, okay? I had three people that were able to do it. And just for laughs, I asked one of them, or I asked them to say, okay, well, if you want extra credit, tell me what my house number is. And some guy in Norway did it. Now, granted, that wasn't directly from the sextant reading. Uh, I, I got my position within seven and a half miles. And people that have seen my videos know, for example, that I live on a lake near an airport and a highway. He combined all of that information. The sextant reading got him in the basic grid zone of where I was. And then he found the lake and he figured out which house was mine. And then he got the house number. So there's good investigation out there. There are good people out there that can, that can actually read these things. Nathan, can you read it? So far, you're really failing miserably. Now, one of your idiots did try this, and we'll talk about it in a bit when we go over to QE's take on all of this crap. But you weren't even willing to try it. Now, not only weren't you willing to try it, you see that information that I have right there, which was posted in your chat for you to see and tagged with you? You wouldn't even look at it. Yeah, the Otis cam, I did, Otis, my cat, had a camera on it. And, um, you know, he had a camera on his collar. He also has a GPS tag on his collar that I can track in real time. So, for example, I can go to my phone and I can find out where he is right now. Tur turns out he's sleeping on the back of the couch in the living room. But if he was down the street, I could find him within about 30 feet. And it tracks his little wanderings. And before we got him fixed, he was doing 90,000 steps a day and walking about 12 miles. And it was fascinating watching him patrol my town. And I put that up a couple of times. Unfortunately, it gave the shape of the lake and the name of some of the streets, although they're pretty common streets. You put two and two together, you could figure out where I was. And I had one of my buddies send me a picture of my house. And I said, yeah, I probably shouldn't put that up. 
No, I do not live on a houseboat. I, uh, no, it's uh, 30 human feet, by the way, Tesla. 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 No, I live on a lake. I have, I live on the junction of a lake and a river. And, uh, you know, I got a pontoon boat, but basically this is a glorified swamp that I live on. It's about four feet deep and choked with weeds. They're in the process of dredging it right now. So let's go ahead and continue with what we're doing. I do believe all of this stuff is coming out okay. I'm going to go ahead and go back on mute. I just wanted to touch on the... Uh, I just wanted to touch on the chat and make sure that I wasn't missing anything out here. I think I've got everything addressed. All right. We do have a celebrity in the in the chat, and that's Where's Wally, my friend from uh, Australia. Does some really strong work down there and is the person that lives rent-free in Mitchell's head. Because Mitchell from Australia really hates Where's Wally because Where's Wally makes him look like a fool on a regular basis. But let's go ahead and have another listen to him here. You know, you're not going to be a reasonable man and do that with us because we're just asking you, given that you've given us two choices, spherical trig and flat earth trig to do this with, and you're not going to get into the wrangle dangle of how spherical trig won't be able to do this with a flat baseline. You can't get an elevation angle from a curved adjacent. You're not going to get into that wrangle dangle. You are absolutely right, Nathan. Damn it, I did that whole thing. I did that whole thing without um without my mic on, didn't I? Well, in any event, what I did was I just showed a sculptor or a sculpture that my friend and and artist Declan Doyle in Ireland made for me. I have two more coming from prominent figures in the flat earth. So you guys are gonna be my little elves on a shelf. So from then on, you know, we'll 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 bring you out periodically. So in any event, let's go ahead and get going with this again. Yep, I know, I was muted. That was my bad, my bad. Boomer moment. Cut me a break, all right? I'm lucky I can see right now. I'm not wearing my eye patch because I think that, uh, I think it kind of distracts from things, but these lights don't make me feel very good and it's rather um, distracting. So cut me a little slack here, guys. But now you won't even define trig. You're just going to deny triangles are needed and no, then leave I, it at that I, and demand that we carry on. Well, okay, how are we going to do that without triangles, Bob? Do you want to define what trig is? The two different trigs. If we're not going to need triangles, can you define what that means? Busted! Numpty dipshit! You're a retard! <laughs> Unbelievable, folks. I have a pertinent question for Paul about this. Well, I want to clarify the challenge, Brian. He said, I the flat earth trig or spherical trig, but then said we don't need triangles. He's still on the panel. I've asked him about five times. Hopefully, Q will stop screaming at him. But I want to know the answer. <laughs> what to do then, Bob, without triangles? My question was standard celestial navigation techniques. Feel free to solve it. And what are they? Triangulation, per se. I did. Triangulation, right? Nope. Well, what's the then other why option? Do we need trig? What's, what's the other option? Trilateration. Trilateration. Why do we need trig? Sorry, Sorry Nathan. It's, it's okay. Sorry. Sorry. Trilateration for the sextant, you say. Chaff and redirect. Indeed. 
chaff and redirect. Get him back, Nathan. <laughs> oh, are we using so the can give me a position, no. gentlemen. I need to know how we're going to do that. Bob. Okay, look, I still need to know clarified from Bob how we can do that. You say either flat earth tree or spherical tree. That, those were the options you gave me, Bob. Right? You can do it any way you want. You, those were you the options the you gave position. me, though, weren't they, Bob? You can use whatever means you wish so long as you give me the correct position which I found with okay. no problem. Okay, I'd like to do it. Oh, okay, okay. okay, okay. I'd like to do it with the vision of being on a sphere. Okay, just, I've got a question though, right? Did you see that? Did you guys catch that? He wants to solve my navigation problem with a condition that he's doing it on a sphere. Why is that? Well, first of all, all the celestial navigation material is based on spherical trig and parallel art rays because those are required to use a sextant. But more importantly, why does he want to do it on a sphere? Because there's absolutely no way he can do it on a flat earth. He's bright enough to understand that and realize that he's trapped. But quite frankly, I'm not letting him go. I'm telling him that, look, I don't care how you do it. You can use whatever model you want, but you have to be able to do it. And you have to explain how you got your answer. And your answer has to be correct. I'm not saying that you have to match me, because I'm a lot better at this than you are, Nathan. I can take any subject that I'm not familiar with, and you take a subject that you're not familiar with, and I can learn more about that subject and understand it better in a weekend than you will in your entire life. So, in the future, the main thing that you really want to do is if you want to find the truth, you need to talk less and you need to listen more to people that actually know what they're talking about. And when it comes to celestial navigation, I'm not a pro, but I'm a talented amateur. And you would be well served listening to things that I say about it because you have not the first clue as to what is going on. And the bad part about it is, I really don't think you realize that. You think you know something about celestial navigation and you don't have the first clue. And we're bringing that out today because what I'm doing is I'm asking you very specifically, I want you to find a location on the earth. It's as simple as that. And just to show you that it can be done. There it is. This is mine. Now, quite frankly, this isn't even my best work. But this is a circle of equal altitude. You notice anything about that circle of equal altitude, Nathan? It's on a spherical Earth, and it's a curve. All right? These red lines are curved because the lines on a circle are curved. However, if you look at it a little bit closer, there's a very distinct point that they cross. That's how trilateration works. Now, first and foremost, there are the Hawaiian Islands. This is within 1,200 miles of the Hawaiian Islands. This is the position I plotted using nothing other than a little spherical trigonometry and understanding of celestial navigation and Google Earth. Now, I actually have software on my phone that will do this. And I want to show you this very, I want this very clear. Do you see that circle right there? That's the actual location of the boat. Now, I don't see my location here, but my actual location plotted by my phone was right here. I'm 10 miles off. Now, this obviously is in error because it's about 45 miles long. 
I don't know if I did my math incorrectly. I haven't really had a chance to look at it. But the position that my calculations gave me was right there, and that's 10 miles from the true position of the ship. So I can do it. And I'm going to do a video here in the next couple of weeks where I'm going to sit down and show how this is done. Now, this circle of equal altitude, as I recall, was from Vega. Vega was centered, the geographic position of Vega was by a little town called Cedarville in the upper peninsula of Michigan. The other star was Capella, and it was centered up here in China. Now, based on the altitude of those stars, you could figure out the distance to the circle of equal altitude based on the number of degrees off of 90. Where those two circles come together, right there, is your position. And that is how you use a circle of equal altitude. There are no triangles involved in this. There are no right angles other than the fact that there is a right angle at the position of the star. That fixes the position of the star because the star is at zenith at that one spot on the Earth. That is the center of your circle of equal altitude. Then all you have to do is you have to look, you know, it's 90 degrees there. For every degree that you're off of 90 degrees at your location, it's 60 nautical miles. Now, the proof is in the pudding right here. I just did it. I did it close enough for somebody at my level of training and my status. I'm not a professional navigator, but 10 miles is well within an acceptable error for somebody like me. I would have been happy if you could have gotten into the general area of Hawaii. But even though that was part of the given of our, our data, you couldn't even do that. Because 10th man did make an effort at doing this, and I credit him for that. Or excuse me, Adam's, Adam Makings did try this. He was hopelessly incompetent, but at least he tried. We'll do that in a bit. <laughs> When I measure my elevation angle, how do I do that from a curved ground beneath my feet? You don't need to. It's already been provided for you. Sorry. No, no, no. When you say it's already been provided, how, how so? It's right in the post. It's right there. What is? Go ahead and have a look. Have you, Just have tell you pulled me. It up? Just tell me. Play along. What's the deal? Is it a have secret? Have you pulled it up? Ugh. Have you pulled it up, What's Nathan? been given to me? Because at the moment right. it hasn't, has it? Because you haven't given it me. You're telling me to go get it. Yeah. So, no, yeah. I'm not going to go yeah, get it. You right. can I give it me or you can't. Maine. Either you give it me or you don't. It's up to you. I Take posted out. it for you in Maine. The whole thing. Just tell me what precisely has already been worked out for me. Is it Earth being a sphere with an R value? Yep. Nathan, it's right there. Just tell me. You can either use it or don't. Use what? Use the use the use the site data that I provided for you. What Very site clearly. data? It's written down. Ugh. What data specifically? The site data is right in time timeout chat. So okay, and it proves we're on a sphere. Harp will it? post it. Harp will post it for you. Okay, and it proves we're on a sphere, does it? Proves I know how to use a sextant. You Does don't. it prove we're on a sphere? I don't know. What well, do then think? why are we doing this? You are the one making the this claim, and you don't, don't shut up. up. Now, I want to address this particular thing because he's using this as a soundbite. His question was, now, first of all, the challenge is, can you find your position given this data? It's a yes or a no question. It's binary. All right. Nathan knows that he can't. So he has spent all of this time trying to dance around this issue. He's trying to play definition games with me, and I'm not playing. Here's the data. Tell me my position. You can either do it or you can't. Period. All right. So now he's trying to say, well, does this prove a globe? 
It's not intended to prove a globe. It's intended to prove that you're incompetent when you talk about a sextant. Because I want to expose your incompetence for your entire audience and any innocent bystanders that may wander by and think you actually know what you're doing. You have no clue. Adam Meekins has no clue. Tenth Man, Brian's Logic, Mitchell from Australia. You are all clueless when it comes to dealing with a sextant. Quantum Eraser regularly bans me from his channel because I, I ask him the same question all the time. QE, do you own a sextant? Have you ever used a sextant? Have you ever been in the same room as a sextant? All right. They can't answer that because they don't. Nathan, to his credit, at least says, no, I've never seen her used a sextant. Good for you. But now what he's trying to do is he's trying to distract again. He's trying to say, well, does this prove the earth is flat? I don't know, does it? What do you think? That's my response. All right. That's not part of my challenge. My challenge is for you to tell me what my position is. I've done it. Can you? All right. Now, he's trying to say that that somehow is noteworthy enough to make a soundbite out of. He takes off the, well, what do you think? When I said, I don't know, what do you think? For some reason, like Quantum Eraser, he selectively edits quotes. You know, I called Quantum Eraser on this once before. You know, there was a... There was a quote that he misappropriated from a science text. Uh, it was, gravity is not a force. When the actual quote, which was discussing the other aspects of space-time, was that gravity is not just a force. All right, there's a subtle but important difference between those two quotes. It's like saying, quantum eraser is not a fraud. All right, versus quantum eraser is not just a fraud, he's a liar and has the maturity of a 12 year old. So when you take all those extra things out, it changes the meaning of the quote quite a bit. So that's a little game that they play. So don't fall for it, folks. And hit those likes and subscribes and remember, I bought this for the channel. That sucker's 400 bucks. All right. Super chats are always appreciated. Remember, we have memberships and Patreons as well. So help, help, help a brother out here. I'm talking. I say you can't. I'm talking, Bob. Sorry, this well, is your plane. I've just asked you. I'll be, you, I'll be Hello. monitoring you. Let me know. You're going to run away because well, I'm wanting to reply to you. Is that what's going to happen, coward? Okay, go on then. Yeah, yeah. he's gone. No worries. Yeah, so I asked him, and what's the point summarizing if he's just going to run like a coward? A dumb ask fuck coward. Excuse <laughs> there's a couple of things he said there, and I wanted to ask him the question Is he using the Earth's surface within his plane? Because it sounds Wait like he's not even using the Earth's surface. Wait, wait a second, wait a second. Go, go back. He said we could use either spherical treg, treg, or flat yeah, earth that's not treg. And then he said, we don't, we're not using triangle. Why go, no, why go why anywhere else? Because that's why I wanted to ask him what he's actually doing, because he may not be using the surface at all. So that means he's not using the triangle. Hang on, guys, hang on. He so then he can't use treg. This guy is such a fool. <laughs> Nathan, if you give me time to summarize. Okay. That's my point. Let's just okay. get it in order. Hold on. Second. Everyone, everyone chat for a second. Brian, Brian. Brian. Hello. Hello. Hello, everyone. Right. QE, get everything out of your system. Then Brian, then 10. QE, go. It's over. It, the, the numpty dipshit, snap, sack sniffing cretin, it's over. When he came in and said, you can use flat earth trig or spherical trig, and then in the next breath said, we're not using triangles. That's a paradox. He doesn't know what trigonometry is. Get it? Correct. It's over. Okay. 
No, actually, QE, that the meaning of that is very clear. What we're demonstrating is that you have no clue what trigonometry is. You have a seventh grade understanding of trigonometry, where you asked your teacher, well, why do they call it trigonometry? And he said, or she said, well, because it involves triangles. That was the end of your understanding of mathematics. Now, we can do a tangent to a point on a circle or a sphere. We can calculate great circle distances on the surface of a spherical object. <coughs> now, this is all trigonometry. Great circles and circles of equal altitude are based on spherical trigonometry. All right. You don't necessarily directly work with a triangle for that. You can use triangles to determine what that circle of equal altitude is. But that's the end of it right there. What you need to do is you need to figure out how big that circle of equal altitude is. And then you just find your position using it. That's called trilateration. Now, if I had had a third circle, I could have nailed that a little bit further. But quite frankly, that's good enough. And I have actual mariners in the chat right now that said, to be honest with you, given a two-star fix, that wasn't all that bad. And I would tend to agree with that. I don't think it was too bad. Could I do better? Yeah, I probably could. Uh, I could probably fix this particular circle right here, which is about 45 miles long. But, but as we'll see, <coughs> sorry. <coughs> but as we'll see, when Adam Makins tried it, uh, he did not get within 45 miles. So basically, my, my kung fu is bigger than your kung fu. So that's that. What trick without what's, trying? What's trying? You can draw the end I'm of the queue, Arwin. Right, Brian next. Thank you, Nathan. Yes, and that's exactly why he said that. That's why I exactly I wanted to ask him about is he using the surface or not? Because if he's using a sextant, right, it means he should be using the surface. Otherwise, he's just taking two mathematical lines, right, an angle. Yes, he is using a triangle to two celestial objects and avoiding the surface. No, he's using a triangle. Yes, yeah. he is. But that's why I wanted to ask him if he's using the surface because our claim is the surface. I want to bring it back to our claim. Our claim is the surface measurement. That was my point. Well, and when he got, said... He got to know what trick sorry. is. Please. It's over. Yeah, I, I understand. Okay, okay. QE. Let Brian get finish. to the end of this point. Right. Yeah, stop please. you both. Ah! Just hold on, Brian. Just stop you both. I, I know. You're right, QE. You're right. You are so right. Yeah, you're right. You're right. Yeah, you're right. <laughs> you see how Nathan Oakley kind of treats QE as a pet? You know, he brings him in uh, for what he wants, which is to disrupt. But when he's trying to make a point, he basically tells QE to shut up. The other thing that's very interesting in the dynamics here, you see how dismissive he was of Arwen? That was another thing that Perspective really pointed out, was how people that go on Nathan's show really become subservient to him. And... Um, you know, sacrifice their own video careers. I mean, how many videos has, has and, and uh, early, early bird shows has Arwin does? Has Arwin done? And does he have a following? Does Nathan have a following? You know, Nathan generally averages around 100 people or so. You know, I don't live stream very much at all. And I've got 156 in the chat right now. You know, that's without even trying. And our channels are the same size. And that is his entire bread and butter, is live streaming. I actually do things. I do experiments. I make, uh, you know, I make, I make observations in the real world. I interpret those observations and show how I, the logic and the science that I use to interpret them. Uh, my show actually has something. His show is basically a rerun every day of the same idiots chanting the same mantra about his little uh, flat earth housekeeping questions. You know, I don't really understand 
why anybody pays any attention to him at all. He's such an insignificant character. But I am having a little bit of fun with him. I don't like bringing attention to him because every time I come on his show, he makes five or six videos out of it. And those are the best videos, you know, the best viewed videos that he has. So basically he gets revenue from that and he gets viewers because, you know, it's, it's so rare that he has somebody that actually understands what they're talking about and is interesting on a show. The vast majority of people on our side of the, uh, our side of the table here don't bother with him anymore. I normally don't bother with him, but every now and then I like to expose him for the fraud that he is. You know, and going and chasing him into his own corner, because you know he won't come out. But chasing him into his own corner and confronting him and making him put up or shut up, as I'm doing in this video, is fun. I, I am amused by it. My audience is amused by it. So that's why I do it every now and then. But normally I don't really give him much attention. QE is pretty much the same way. QE is kind of like watching a barn fire. You know, there's nothing there, but they're kind of fascinating to watch once in a while. And, you know, the only thing that I can say about QE that is any a, a redeeming feature of any kind at all is the way that he curses is really original. It's creative. And it's a great turn of fate. Uh, it's, it's a great turn of a phrase. You know, I've got a new word here from Nathan, and that's wrangle dangle. I'm going to start using that in honor of Mr. Wrangle Dangle himself, Nathan Oakley. So let's go ahead and have a listen a little bit more. We're getting a few likes and such now, so that's great. Brian's got an ancillary point, and I'm going to shout out a super chat in this break. So, think outside the container, says Nathan, quote, does it prove we live on a sphere, question mark, end quote, Bob, quote, I don't know, end quote. <laughs> Go ahead, Brian. Okay, thanks, Nathan. Okay, why I wanted to know if he's using the surface, because if he's not, it means he's moving away from our actual claims. All right, I'm just going to pause here real quick to acknowledge somebody. We have Professor Phil Bell in the chat right now, which is kind of interesting because Phil is an actual rocket scientist. He puts rockets and satellites into orbit. Nathan and Brian's logic and these other band of idiots like to argue with people like Phil Bell about rocket science. You know, the other day I was on the shills and I was having a quote-unquote, debate with an anti-vaxxer. In other words, you have somebody that at best has a high school education going up against a physician on a matter of health care. There was blood and fur on the floor after that, like you wouldn't believe, and I was nice to him. Bill uh, is a crusty old codger like me. And, you know, we have a, a certain limit of our BS that we tolerate, and then we basically eviscerate you. Phil's very much like that with, you know, like I am with that. But, you know, if I want to know something about rocket scientists, I'm not going to make a video on it. I'm going to go call Phil and say, hey, Phil, tell me about this. And he'll, he'll sit down and explain it to me and make sure that I understand it. That's the way a teacher works. But in any event, let's go ahead and finish this up. Which is a straight line horizontal distance along the surface of Earth. And secondly, he claims trilateration, which are straight lines. So what's he talking about? If he's taking an angle, right, a triangle, I get it painted, or uh, QE is 100% correct about the trigonometry. And that's why he jumped on the surface thing. Because what he said about two lights in the sky and an angle to them, Right, but he's avoiding the surface from the sounds of it. That's what of course. I that out. And then trilateration is straight line distances. So what's he talking about? I'm glad, you've, sum I'm glad you've summarized it because I was, I was a millisecond away from doing exactly the same. And QE just went 
Chaffin redirect in the background. <laughs> and I went, yeah, it is, isn't it? Why am I so tempted to latch on to this trilateration claim? It still needs qualifying, though, so I'm glad you're out, Brian. Thank you. Ten, go ahead. Like the oh, right, this, this not... further. Uh, okay, you can join the queue as well, then. Uh, was that Harb? Who was that? Uh, he was telling you that I was going to find it for you, like, and I wasn't going to, but then I went ahead and did. So, and then also Citation Police did also. Okay. So they're in the main chat. Yeah, so thank you very much. I okay. got some questions about it. I got some questions about we, we, it. We'll have to get to it in the after show, uh, Citation. I'm just going to get the last thoughts from 10th. Alwyn's joined in the queue before the live show, but we're taking away. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Bob never cites anything. Bob cites his deranged mind. That's it. He never shows anything. We started with the air navigation, volume one, and I have both of them, volume two. But this one, Department of the Air Force. And we went through what they say is needed. They say, what? 90 is needed. They say a triangle must equal 180. We're showing from the source how to do celestial navigation. Bob comes in with his deranged brain cells and says that the Air Force and this manual that has served our pilots and navigation on planes well is wrong. No, you unobject moron. I'm not saying the manual is wrong. I'm saying that you have no clue what's in the manual because you never read it. And if you did look at a snippet or two, you didn't understand it because you were just cherry picking for things that you thought made you look good. All right. The fact that I can find my position says it all. The proof's in the pudding. If you're such a damn expert, on celestial navigation because you own a copy or you downloaded a copy of the air navigation manual great tell me my position it's not time for your bluster anymore i don't want to listen to your bullshit i want two things from you i want a latitude and i want a longitude and i want to know where that sextant where those sextant readings were taken all right I've given you the information. Everything that you need is right there, my friend. Everything that you need. I used that and I found my position within 14 nautical miles. I redid it a little bit last night and I got it within 10. All right. You don't need anything more than that. All you need in addition to the data is a basic understanding of how celestial navigation works. And you know something? You're going to need a globe for that. And you're going to need parallel rays of light. And you're going to need the ability to do some very basic mathematics and look some things up on a chart. If you would like to learn how to do this, I will teach you. All right? But here's the deal. There is a relationship between teacher and student. And that means that if you need clarification, you can ask me a reasonable clarification. All right. I'm not teaching you something to have you debate it with me. I will explain to you how it works and make sure that you understand it, but I'm not going to debate it with you. All right. I can do it. You can't. That is all that we need to know. God damn it. Oh, no, wrong mic. Sorry about that, folks. I thought I did that all on mute, and that was a really great speech. I would have, I would have been sad if I had missed that. Pardon the French, by the way. That's what he's doing now. If you go to Master B, Nathan. I have the quote by Harold Jacoby there. You can please go there. It's the last two slides. This is a dean of astronomy, Columbia University, 
with a, a book that is so good that they put it on one of those lists that said, we got to keep this book going. And in here, in the part that I've underlined, it says, this height of the sun or of any star in the sky is called its altitude. And so altitude is always an angle to be measured in degrees of minutes. The point directly overhead is the zenith. The angle between lines drawn to horizon and the zenith is 90 degrees. Or isn't you complete and utter idiot? If you are standing on the bridge of a ship 100 feet off the water, your 90 degrees to your zenith is to your horizontal. It's not down to the surface of the, of the ocean. That's why we have a dip correction, because you look down to the horizon and up to the star. That's your raw sextant reading. Then you apply your corrections. The first one is the, uh, the instrument correction, the instrument error. And that just has to do with the settings on your instrument. It may be off just a little bit. My bubble sextant's got an instrument error of approximately, called an index error of approximately five minutes. All right. The way you determine that is you take a known altitude of Jupiter, for example, and you cite Jupiter, and you see what you get and compare it to the known altitude at that moment. And you can tell that there's a slight difference. Now, my marine sextant has an index error of zero. So that's a lot easier to calibrate. The next thing that you have to correct in your dip correction is refraction. And that is a known measurable quantity. That's not in, it's not in debate. It varies a little bit under conditions, but under standard conditions, we know what the refraction is and we apply that to our rules or to our dip correction. The last one, of course, is the curve of the earth, because as you're in, ele uh, in elevation above the surface of the earth, you're looking down at the curve and because the earth is curved, you can see a little bit further or you, your, your distance is a little different and your angle is a little different than if you're looking out over a flat surface. These are all known factors. You can easily reproduce the dip corrections by using Walter Bislin's advanced earth curve calculator and looking at the dip to the horizon under standard refraction from a certain height. You know, from any given height, it will match the dip correction. And that has to do with the curved earth, the refraction, and the elevation above the surface. All right. The next thing that you have to correct on your raw reading is the refraction of your celestial object. Now, not putting these corrections in, with the exception of the index error, which could be quite significant if you screwed up with it, if you do not apply dip and refraction corrections, if you're down close by the water, this was done at, I think, nine feet, and, you know, you just ignore refraction and, you know, the, you know all the factors of the dip correction, and you don't, play, you don't pay any attention to the refraction of the star above you, you are still going to be within about 10 nautical miles of your position. Those are the things that just kind of zero it down. Because, for example, refraction at 45 degrees is about three minutes of angle. Refraction at 10 feet, the dip correction, is going to be about three minutes of angle. Add the two together, you're going to get about six minutes of angle. That's six nautical miles on the surface of the Earth. All right you put those corrections in so you get a little closer to your true position. But quite frankly, if you're a thermonuclear weapon, that's close enough. For a right angle, this Bob is so Lost. I can't even believe he comes in here with no citations, no references, nothing, quotes himself, and then goes against everything his side has put in print. A sextant is an angle measuring device. Yeah, at least he's come in. Uh, good I on you, Bob. Good. Get my props. I mean, at least you got I some balls, right. Bob. Big ones, Nathan. Real big ones. You know how you can tell? I don't hide in an I don't hide in an echo chamber with a mute button and a volume control. If I want to have a position out there, I'll subject it to the scrutiny of others. 
If I get corrected, I'll learn from that correction. That is the key difference between a flat earther and a normal person, or a conspiracy theorist, science denier, and a normal person. All right? If I ask a question, I actually listen to the answer. And then if I have a follow-up question, it's related to the, to the answer that I just got. And I make sure that I understand that. And you know something? I don't answer, I don't ask the same question again because I already did that and I learned from the answer. All right? That is a key difference between a normal person and a science denier. How many times does a flat earther ask exactly the same question or chant the same mantra? How many times, when's the last time you heard the horizon rises to eye level? When's the last time you heard a curve to Jason? where no adjacent exists. When's the, when's the last time you heard Nathan and his little crew say that in a geometric sphere, the horizon with radius 3959, the horizon can be no more than 1.22 times the square root of your height and feet away from you. Okay, first of all, that's wrong. The correct way of phrasing that is no less because refraction extends the horizon in most cases. Now, obviously, there are some exceptions to that. You could get some weather correct weather conditions that would cause sinking. But the vast majority of the time, what you do is you get looming and your horizon is extended. For example, in the black swan image, even though they like to say that the horizon's 10 plus miles, well, great. How many miles to the horizon? If you want to claim it's over 10, I want you to tell me how you got that number and what that number is. Because I've measured it myself by actually analyzing the photograph. The horizon in the black swan image is at 1.85 miles. It is between the shore and the nearest oil rig. Because you never looked at the thing, because you had a narrative and you thought because there was a false horizon, also known as fairy fog or a fate of out beyond it, a well-known uh, refractive effect. It's simply a mirage, all right? You never actually looked at the photograph because if you did, answer a couple of key questions for me. Where's the boat deck on that far oil rig? The boat deck that is 15 to 20 feet above the surface of the water. Point it out to me in the image. No, you can't do that because it's beyond, it's blocked by the horizon and the water because it's beyond the curve of the earth. Now, even on the near oil rig, you're missing three to five feet. That's a little bit more variable because it's, you know, trying to measure that amount is rather difficult, but you can clearly see that the entire boat deck in uh, Platform Hill House is missing. And that platform is 15 to 20 feet above the surface of the water by construction documents. And I pulled that up and I did it right in front of Brandon. He agreed with me the entire time we were doing it. He agreed with me that he could not see that, that something was hiding it. And then I said, well, there's demonstration of the curve of the earth for you. Well, no, that's not what it is. All right. It doesn't, you know, adults, when given corrective information, especially with the back, you know, the, the basis of that corrective information, reassess their views. Flat earthers and science deniers cannot assess their, reassess their views because their narrative is their identity. It's their personality. What is Nathan and what is QE if not for their flat earth work and their prominence in the flat earth community? They're nothing. All right. They're insecure, and they have nothing else that they have power over. And being in the flat Earth makes them important. Do you honestly think that if we put them on a SpaceX and put them into orbit and said, look, there it is. It's a sphere. You are in space. They will come down and claim it was the windows. They cannot accept corrective information that challenges their belief, which in turn challenges their identity. And that's sad.
And the rest of these idiots, quite frankly, are even sadder because they follow along. They don't know any better. Is it balls? Yeah, is it, is. it is. I would imagine it's terrifying here, right? I can empathize with their side of this argument. And I've got props for Bob, right? It's scary coming here. So for Bob to just brush it off, come in, put his stuff down, make his demands that we should fulfill his challenge, not answer any questions, obfuscate and then run away. That is more than most of them are capable of. That deserves some props. I don't care if you don't like it. Props, Bob. Oh, wait. I don't. I, I, I think he's here for another reason. He's yeah, it's in pretty a, fair belief. No, of course. I, I think, I know, yes, of course, but he's, he can't even do that because he's not even following the books that are out there that tell you how to do celestial navigation. He's it's not stupid. even doing celestial. It's so stupid. He's he's yeah, boys and girls, I can do it. Can you? I don't think so, Chief. That's the position of the boat. How come you can't tell me that? Well, he's trying to reinvent a new form of triangulation that doesn't use no, triangles. No, 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 he's not. He's too stupid to realize he's a numpty dipshit. I, uh, are you going to be cutting that out today? One doesn't Probably. exclude the other. And do uh, you have any anything else? To, yeah, probably will, Kiwi. I'm just going to read out this super chat for Five Ropes. Thank you very much, Five Ropes, for super chat. It says, how can Bob face his subscribers after what happens each and every time he comes here? <laughs> just like this, Sonny. Just like this. And what I do is I take your silliness, I dissect it. My audience and I talk about it for a while. And then we all have a good laugh. And then we get on with our lives because we actually have things that we do. All right. We don't live on YouTube. We don't live trying to promote a fantasy that we can't support. We don't claim to know how to use a sextant and then not be able to use a sextant. So I don't really have a problem facing my audience. And I still have a larger audience than you do. I surpassed you in less than two years from the time I started doing my YouTube channel. I regularly have more viewers, and quite frankly, that's because I put out interesting things. Not always right, but that's kind of adds to the fun of it, doesn't it? Isn't it fun to be able to correct me once in a while and then listen to me actually accept that correction? That's something that you will never see in the science denial community. I absolutely eviscerated Brian's logic with two videos. Why two? Because when I did it the first time, I expected him to learn his lesson. I expected him to learn something about the errors of his reasoning and understanding of what great circles were, for example, or rum lines. But rather than actually learn something from the video, he doubled down. Quite, no, no, no. I was right. I was right. I don't ma it doesn't matter that you have all of that there and all this evidence supporting you and you can show me how it works my opinion is right because it follows along with my narrative so i did it again to him i was a little less nice to him the second time if i have to do a third one i'm probably going to be a little rough on him uh, i don't like doing that because i don't think people get educated with it but if i have to correct you for a third time that means that you're not willing to be educated and you're the subject of ridicule and you are an object lesson for people to learn from. So let's go ahead and finish this up. Then if you'd like, let's go ahead and have a look at QE's follow-up on this, which was fascinating because the uh, Adam Meekins actually tried to do this. He tried to find a position of the ship and it was hilarious. Just a hint, one was in the middle of a desert and the other position was not in Hawaii. <laughs> no, just a, I, I don't concern myself with Bob Howe 
copes with it. But I'm, as I said earlier, I'm a bit lost for words because I'm pleased he's come in. You know, he's giving us the opportunity to at least address some of the stuff with obfuscation attached and, you know, just like I said earlier, lots of demands that we just do his challenge. Like, oh, well, what's it going to prove? Well, I asked him, does it prove a globe? I don't know, <laughs> was his answer. <laughs> so what, what can you do with that? Well, what you do with that is you actually do a live stream on it. So in any event, I'm going to leave this up for just a minute. I'm thinking about going and queuing up Huey. Do you guys want to have a listen to him? Is he worth the time or we ha we had enough fun for today? Well, Haditz, thank you very much. I'm very glad to see that you find my channel useful. Declan Doyle, who did the sculptures, this one right here, for example, and who's working on a couple more for me, is actually in the chat right now. Declan, uh, let's go ahead and make sure that you've got some mod status here, because what I want to do with you is I would like you to take a moment and stick a link to your catalog up there just so people can see some of the really good work that you do. I mean, it's utterly amazing what Declan can do. So, I'm gonna go ahead and quit that one. I'm gonna let him go ahead and do that while I get this other one queued up. But we'll have a look here, this is the that's how you do great circles. That's the correct way to do them. Now, I'm thinking that this might be it real quick. Noon that I listened in with that Highlander guy. A bit of flatness. Step away from that, that point source. Everything falls away from you if it's on a sphere. Therefore, the tangent plane you've just generated no longer has any reference to the surface that you're supposedly referencing. Right, it's it's an imaginary thing in reference to another shape. Right? It's like sticking a tea tray on top of a football. Exactly. Oh, I understand that. Yes, yes. I was looking for a more technical definition just to make sure we have our ducks in a row. But it's about as useful, isn't it? <laughs> when you think uh, in the surface. Yeah. In the metric techniques. Yeah. Sure. I don't know what that means. With a flat horizon in the front of it, so that uh, he needed the flat horizon and he. <laughs> suitable. It, it's written he needs a mountain suitable and, and, and flat horizon. And then he can reach the point of. Then he can find out the radius. Yeah, I have it right here. I just put it up on. <laughs> Now, what I want to do here is I want to have a look at this. Let me go ahead and get me off of this. This is the Al Biruni method to find the height of the mountain. Now, a couple of things that I really just want to point out here. <clears throat> the way this works is you can't measure this area that's underneath the mountain. However, what you can do is you can measure the distance between this point and that point, And you can get an angle to the height of the mountain you know, the top of the mountain. And by using these angles, you can actually calculate this distance h. All right, that's a basic trigonometric function. Now, what they like to laugh about is that this is a flat baseline. 
Well, let's go ahead and have a look at that. Now, we're not dealing with hundreds of miles here. We're dealing with maybe five nautical miles, okay, from here to here. So we have Earth curve over five nautical miles. Now here's the question for y'all. How much curvature is in that five miles? If it's five nautical miles and there is one not or there is one degree in sixty nautical miles, that is one twelfth of a not of a of a degree of Earth curve. Now, would you add that to the height of the mountain that you measured, or subtract it? I wonder if any of the flat earthers out there know. So, would you add that one twelfth of a degree? Degree. Or would you subtract it? Yeah, tiny captain, I know. Uh, yeah, they're circles of equal altitude. I believe I said that very clearly. I, I was talking about great circles, and then I was also talking about circles of equal altitude. Two different things. So, we could actually do that, couldn't we? I'm wondering. Let's go to a math portal. stick this over here. Let me make this guy a little smaller. But here's the math portal right triangle calculator with detailed explanation. I kind of like it. So, so I'm thinking that this will do it right here. So what we're going to want to do is we're going to want to see what this distance is. Now, distance B is going to be, I'll tell you what, let's just go ahead and do this right. Let's say it's five nautical miles. All right. What I'm going to do with that is I'm going to take, there's 6,080 feet roughly in a nautical, a nautical mile. I know i got navigators and sailors out there that may say, well, 6,000, it's 6,080.28 feet, you know. That may be true, but we're going to use 6,080 because, hey, roll with it. So that's 30,400 30, feet. So side B right here is going to be 30,400 feet, okay? I'm going to get rid of that. Now, the next thing that we're going to want to do is we're going to want to put in angle alpha here. So what we're going to do is since five nautical miles would represent one twelfth of the curved surface of the Earth, we're going to put that angle in. And that's 0 0.083 degrees. All right. So I'm thinking that we might have enough to do that here. Forty-four feet. All right. So here's the question for you guys. <coughs> Why don't you go ahead and put that forty-four feet into a six hundred foot mountain? And we'll calculate the difference in the dip to the horizon. And that's going to be pretty easy to do. Let's go ahead and do that real quick. So here's old Walter. Walter's a good guy. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to put this in freedom units. And we're going to give us an observer height of 600 feet. We're going to give a target distance of 100 miles, say. That should be well, with, uh, well beyond our horizon. 
and we're going to put in standard refraction. How's that sound? Now, right down here, the dip angle to the horizon is going to be 0.39. I'm thinking that's 559. Five, 3959. Nine. Isn't that interesting? Huh. All right. Now, let's go ahead and change this to 644 feet. Because we would have to add that 1 12th of a degree. Now, what's the dip to the horizon? 0 0.4195. Or 0 0.410195. Okay. So it makes a very tiny difference. Now, the next question that you would have to have is how much of a difference would that make? in the radius of the Earth. Now, I'm going to, as this is an education channel, I think rather than do this right now, let's go ahead and pull up the Al Biruni formula and let you guys do that at home. Nathan's already a glober. He already knows what the globe, he already knows the Earth is a globe. This is all a script and an act for him. Let's find a nice clear example of the method Al Biruni. And there it is. So cosine alpha is the angle, the dip angle. So go ahead and go to Walter Bislin's Earth Curve Calculator and calculate the dip angle for 600 feet versus 644. And then go ahead and put those angles in for angle alpha. See what the difference in the radius is. Uh, I don't think you'd have to pack a lunch to walk the distance that would be the difference. All right. So all the, this is a classic example of what science deniers like to do. Remember the five classic tropes or characteristics of science denial. The first one is cherry picking information. This would fall under that. All right. They are cherry picking information because they think that we're not aware that the baseline for Al Biruni would be slightly curved to the tune of one twelfth of a degree or less. All right. That's fine. All right. The other thing that they have is poor logic. They don't understand that this actually does measure the distance to the center of the earth. And they also fail to understand that this is not the proof that the earth is a sphere. That was already known. All this is, is trying to figure out how big a sphere it is. All right. And finally, an unrealistic expectation on science. All right. How much of a difference in the radius would one twelfth of a degree or 44 feet on a 600 foot mountain make? Not a whole hell of a lot. All right. Is it the difference between a spherical earth and a flat earth? Absolutely not. Is refraction the distance, the difference between a spherical earth and a flat earth? Absolutely not. But the fact that there is a slight difference, you know, Newton versus Einstein, what does that have to do with the path of a bullet or an aircraft or Coriolis? Nothing. All right. Is there a slightly different answer given by each, by each model of looking at this thing we call gravity? Yeah. Uh, how many decimal places do you need to go out to actually see what that difference is? But in any event, let's get back here with, with our buddies. But go ahead and do that calculation, folks. Convince yourself of it. Because not only by doing the calculation yourself, not only will you learn how to do it, but you'll also personally realize that this is a, a, an objection that doesn't need to be made.
Hey, Brenda, you out there? Let's double check something here. There we go. Got you all set up. So let's go ahead and make this a little bit smaller. Don't think we need that. You know, the very fact that there's a disclaimer out here. The flat earth model is an archaic and scientifically disproven concept of the earth shape as that of a plane. You know, you would think that they would actually read the thing that's on their own videos. Thank you very much for that super chat, David. I really appreciate it. That, that's how I finance this channel and um, get cool stuff for it. You know, like I said, we just got this astrolabe. 2022 is going to be the year of the astrolabe because I'm going to be doing an awful lot of work with that. Today or tomorrow, I'll, I'll get a wooden astrolabe that we're going to put together on live on, on a live stream. And in addition to that astrolabe, I'm getting an armillary sphere, which is 2,200 years old and also very clearly demonstrates that the Earth is spherical. Uh, let's see. Maxim, where's my R patch? I thought that the patch was acting as a distraction on the video. And as a result of that, I decided that I was not going to wear it. Um, it's annoying because I have these very large floaters in my eye and the lights hurt it. So it causes me some pain. But I thought that it was important not to have that be a distraction from the message that I'm using. If it gets too bad, I'll put it back on. But for those of you that are curious and want to figure out what the hell I'm doing here, uh, that eye patch is not, not a prop. I uh, had what's called a vitreous detachment about a week, 10 days ago. It's a common problem in men my age. Uh, it is not a retinal detachment, so I can still see out of the eye. Uh, although retinal detachments are very common in the first six weeks afterwards. Um, what, it, what it looks like is that you have floaters that are like this big in your eye. Uh, the, one, the ones that I have look like uh, big, large uh, trash can garbage bags flying in the air. And uh, in Michigan, that's kind of difficult because it looks very much like a deer coming out off the side of the road. And, you know, the chance of swerving and having an accident with something like that uh, is increased. Although, you know, I was professionally trained as a driver. It's not something, it's not something that I would probably do very much, but you never know what'll happen. And you don't, you know, it's kind of like, you know, the voices in your head, well, this, these are the images in my eye that aren't really there, but I can see them. And it's, it's difficult at times. But it's normally not a very painful condition, but the eye is quite, it's distracting. Um, you know, I'm going to get one. I'm going to get, get a Jolly Rogers put on it if I'm going to have. They say that this should get better in about six months, but we'll see. Um. It distracts me. So somebody says that my comfort is more important and it's not as much of a distraction. It distracts me. And it it's not something that I want to do on the air. As long as the lights aren't too bad and I'm not doing this too long and I'll be quitting this pretty quick for that reason. Um, you know, I'll just, I'll just kind of carry on a little bit. I only have one more thing that I really want to hit on this though. Ridiculous. I just put it up on screen for everyone. So, uh, there's some other clues that make his worldview known. Train wrecking himself again. First of all, 
Okay, well, we're, you know, the lights do bother it, so I'm going to probably uh, drop off here pretty quick, but there is one more thing that I do want to discuss, and that is Adam Meekins and his attempt to solve this problem. Now, I've already shown you exactly where the boat is, all right? It's about 110 or 120 miles north-northwest of the Big Island of Hawaii, okay? That is a very well established and it's verified by me, it's verified by Ion, it's verified by the authors of the book that wrote the book on the sailing voyage. It was a navigation exercise book where they tried it, they charted a, a yacht trip basically from the west coast of the United States out to California and they did all of the navigation in book form uh, along the way. So they took it directly out of the logs of the journey and the worksheets and everything and it was to work up the navigation. So let's go ahead and listen to Adam Meekins make an effort here to try and solve this problem. First of all, he doesn't know. We already established some time ago that he didn't know what a circle was, right? Which it, by itself is belly laughing hilarious. Now today, unsolicited, came in and showed that he has no clue what trigonometry is. Ballers have no clue what it is. They can say the terms, but they don't know what they mean. So Bob Rooney comes in and says, we can use spherical trig and flat earth trig, and then says in the very next breath that there are no triangles. When trigonometry is the study of triangles, how can you... What? You clown! But I'll play it again here before we go. Before you do, John, I hope you'll in there or reiterate the point. As well as him demonstrating that, he did make his worldview known with regards to how you define the nature of the surface of, of the earth, which is if Nathan in his sexton numpties or whatever the phrase was can answer this question, then it's round, and if not, then it's flat. Um, I had to take the dog for a walk, but when I did get back, I did answer the question, and maybe after you've played it, I'll go through just it's a bit naughty. It's obviously going got two locations, but um, I posted the pictures in, in chat, and I'll just solve it for them if they wish, which should then define their reality of what the nature of the Earth is. Apparently. How, how, long, how long is this going to take? You want me to pull these up, and you want to go through this? Yes, it's just two minutes because you know, there's only two possible solutions. Well, okay, so quickly, put, there's two possible solutions because he's, he's only, we've not got three positions to to locate ourselves exactly, definitively as as one specific point. We've only got two stars, so that will leave two possible locations. Now, I have a responsibility to my audience, especially to those of you out there that actually understand a little bit about navigation or how a sextant works or anything. I want to caution you to wear gloves. Put that monitor away because you are going to come up, you're going to, you are about to hear some of the worst dumb fuckery. I have seen on YouTube. So you have been warned. And if you look at the first picture, which I reject, because there's some other clues in the information is that you're somewhere near Hawaii, um, 1500 miles or something like that. So the first place appears to be like Northern Mongolia where the, the, the location could be. So I ruled that one out as Northern Mongolia is not on the sea. Um, and it's not that near Hawaii. So you're going with the second one? Do you want me to pull the second one up? Yeah. So the second one is, I've, I've zoomed in a bit more just to give the location. Now, I do want to give a disclaimer here because for some reason, the time and date that Bob Rooney took these 
uh, measurements was in 1982. Um, and the almanacs I've got access to, yeah, the app that works out, it would, doesn't go back before 2006. So I've done this one on the earliest date I could um, then, you see, so which is, is 2006. Okay. You want to um, stop for a second? I got a question. All right, so you've taken and ran with a challenge from a window-licking knuckle-dragger that doesn't know what a circle is and demonstrated unsolicited that he doesn't know what trigonometry is, and you took the challenge anyway. What did I take? You know, I don't, I like, I, I like a quite, I, I don't like an unanswered question. And <laughs> it's not, it's not a difficult challenge. Like I said, I'd have done it on the show, but I, I always take the dog for a walk at four. Yeah. So um, oh. off I went and I came back to, to and I thought, well, I'll, I'll just do it this afternoon. So I've done it, put it in the war room for people to see. But there was somebody in chat. Um, who was it? Um, somebody called Slide Rules and Mathematics that was saying it wasn't, we've got to give him an answer. Um, so I've given it there. The, the, the look, the locations, the, Coordinates are there and put your little picture. Um, and if you look at it, it's about 1500 odd miles. Um, Hawaii is, is that obviously to, to the west, directly over there. But one of the questions was I, I did say you could ask Mary Magdalene, and this is Mary Magdalene Island here. Um, so it's somewhere, it's somewhere in location to that. Like I said, there is a bit of variance in my answer because. I've had to use the almanac from 2006 star positions. Gotcha. Um, so we know they'll be a little bit different to 2000, uh, sorry, 1982. Right. They um, would be, but he's too stupid to even realize that. You know, I love it when somebody that can find the ship's location within 10 nautical miles is stupid. Let's see where his location is. Oh, tell me I didn't shut that down. Doggone it. There we go. All right. So, everybody see this really well? Okay. Here is my location, which actually came up to here. But that's the actual location of the boat. Okay. This distance right here is 46 miles. All right. Do you want to see where his location was? There is Mary Magdalene Island. His location was right here. How far is that to the actual location of the ship? Let's go have a look. And we're doing it in nautical miles, of course, because this is the sea, and that's just the way it's done. Dude, that looks like you're about 2,600 miles off, almost 2,700 miles off. That's utter incompetence. If you were at sea navigating, you would die. All right. You have not the first clue how to do this problem on a flat earth or on a sphere earth. And I found it interesting that you used a Mercator projection to try and do this with and still couldn't get it, even though that's a projection of the globe. So this is their sextant expert. That is how far he was off. That far right there. So much for their sextant experts. You know, I did invite them to phone a friend. Apparently they didn't. Maybe they don't have any friends. But I do applaud Adam for at least trying this uh, incompetently, but trying it. So I think that's probably all I really wanted to do with this. Um, so just to sum everything up, I chased Nathan into his hole and asked him, to give me an actual position from a ship. And that position is right there, okay? 
that is the data that I gave him, and that is the data that I used to solve this. All right? He could not do it. His approach was to try and challenge my understanding of what trigonometry was. All right, Nathan, your math obviously stopped at about the seventh grade. I went a little further than that. Don't challenge me. I will eat you alive, and I'm not even the smartest one out here. Okay? That is a bad move on your part. So, not only couldn't he do it, he couldn't even find a creative way to try and distract me. He got frustrated when I wasn't buying his crap and playing into his little distraction game. Then he brought in a quantum eraser to yell and swear and distract. That pissed him off because I didn't pay any attention to him. I didn't bother with him. I didn't feel that he was really worth my time to respond to. It just wasn't anything that was worth it. All right, so I didn't bother responding to it. I'm going to go ahead and save this. This is going to be Adam's line. Adam's sextant reading. Sextant position. Because I just want to hang on to that. We'll bring that up frequently in the future. All right. So John came in to try and distract and irritate me. And the thing that he succeeded in doing is seeing that I could ignore him, which drove him absolutely insane to the point that as soon as he got done on this, he had to go do his own live stream and berate me some more with his little definition game about what trigonometry is. Uh, that's really all they have is they have these little games but when faced with somebody that can actually play the games with them and knows their game and makes you play my game, that is very frustrating to them. And that's something that I do enjoy doing once in a while. If you guys like it, I'll go in and zap them a couple more times. Uh, but really, he's not that interesting to me. Neither one of them are. Because, I mean, their, their stuff is just so childish. Their behavior is so childish. And by the way, I didn't have any problem finding the information. I just used an app on my phone. To be honest with you, it's got all the almanacs right in it. You know, all I have to do is just pull it up. There's my location. You just put in your site readings, it does the math for you. Now I confirm the math and, and plotted this on Google Earth myself, which is why it's probably off a little bit. Uh, but it's not that difficult to do. It takes a little practice, but you can easily do it. So, unless anybody else has anything else out in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and bid you all a fair, a fair adieu. I'm going to get out of these lights and see if I can relax my eye a little bit. But I want to thank you all very much for stopping by. It's very important for you guys to come in and support the channel here like you do, uh, just with your viewership and your super chats and everything else. Oh, you actually are doing the uh, QE figure right now, Declan? <coughs> and you're publishing some stuff on that? I'd love to see that. And uh, I'll post it in the chat, or not in the chat, but in the, in the comment section. So folks can go ahead and have a look at it if you wish. Yeah, the Three Word Emergency Services app is something that's very interesting. There are a couple of things that I'd really like to look into. I would like to call your attention to Scott Manley, who is a really good YouTube creator that not only did the parallax measurements of the moon, and remember, if we know the distance to the moon, we have the radius of the Earth. And unless you want to sit down and... Uh, challenge the math, quite frankly, that pretty much settles it. Another another one that we have in here is Chris Durham, who actually did the Flat Earth Wars song for me. He's a very talented musician. Tiny Captain, who was involved in the Sextant Challenge with MC Tune, and uh, actually previewed all of this stuff before it even came to us. And then Ion and I were two of the testers that did it, but uh, there were others. 
and we're getting ready to actually do another one. We're going to be doing some multiple star sites at night near landmarks. So I've got to go on out and I've got to try and get a three star site for MC and he's going to put that up as a challenge and then I'm going to do I'm going to do the navigation on it and to have a video of me actually doing it near an identifiable landmark so that we can confirm that's where it was. But we'll be doing that in the future. So I'm going to go ahead. Uh, where's Wally? Is a is another great content creator. Mary Marianne is out there too. Uh, she's been a, a great contributor to the channel. We've got Judy Bassett, Declan Doyle, Colon, Lone Tech always has great comments. Arto, we got a bunch of folks out here that Charlie Welch. John Watson's in, in the in the chat. And David Oliver, of course, great supporter of the channel. Yeah, we got some nice people out here. Oh, Alan. It's always good to have a real active chat out here. So do me a favor, guys. Make sure you hit that like and subscribe. If any of you would consider uh, becoming patrons of the channel, you know, I actually do do things with that. Please take a moment and do that. There is, should be a link on the, on the description. Board memberships, of course, are always available. Or every now and then I just put up a PayPal for something special. Like, for example, that's how I raise the funds for the Astrolabe. This is a very interesting one. It's not a traditional Astrolabe. It's got one face. It's got one face that is a traditional Astrolabe. And on the back, it's what's called the Universal Astrolabe de Roja. And what you do with this is you set this to your latitude. And then using the angle of the sun on a particular date, and the dates are listed out here both both in our standard calendar and in the zodiacal calendar. You can find your time and location very precisely. For example, I'm at 44 degrees north latitude and I'm 9 degrees of longitude west of the center of the eastern time zone. And as a result, my time and the equation of time right for this particular date right now, uh, solar noon in Greenwich is going to be about 12, 10 p.m. So you can use that to actually calculate. You'll get a you'll get a solar time reading from this, and then what you have to do <coughs> is add or subtract, as the case may be, generally add the correction for the equation of time and for your change in latitude or change in longitude. And this will give me the time accurate to five to 10 minutes, simply by measuring the angle to the sun from my location. And it's very, it's a lot of fun to do. Uh, you can do it based on stars at night. Uh, this particular one does not allow me to find the direction to Mecca, although some of them, some of the more traditional ones do. The one that we'll be building will be able to do that. So we're going to put together a wooden one to show how everything. No, there's not much of a there's not much of a difference between a Patreon and a member of the channel beta. As a matter of fact, let's make sure that you're a moderator. Uh, the Patreon's just basically, um, you know, generally the contributions are a little bit larger there. They're generally uh, they're generally on the order of ten to fifty dollars a month. Uh, the memberships of the channel are generally five to twenty, or yeah, about five to twenty bucks a month. Uh, everybody that's got that has free access to the twenty four seven live stream, which we run every day. Normally, you would have a green a green room that you would go into, and somebody would bring you in. But um, if you're a member or a Patreon of the channel, you know you've demonstrated your support of the channel enough that you know you have free access to that to the actual live stream room. You can go directly into it without having to stop at the green room and be brought in by a moderator. You know, little perks like that. Plus, you know, I do try and roll a little thing at the end of each video, thanking thanking my channel, members and Patreons especially. But again, this is not a pay to play channel. This is not going to be a channel where I'll have members only videos and, you know, the regular unwashed masses 
get the videos a week later like Nathan does. That's just a little money-making scheme that he does. You know, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to penalize you. Thank you, John. I'm, I'm not going to penalize you if you choose not to financially support the channel. To be honest, whether you No, you didn't. You didn't hear me say anything about QE feeding sugar to diabetics. I said his the high point of his career was getting sugar-free butterscotch pudding on the diabetic menu. So that's I didn't I didn't suggest that QE was giving sugar to diabetics. But you know, I mean, if you want to, that's that enables me to get cool stuff. So the two things that I you know obviously have the 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 full size astrolabe right now. That's a a one kilogram eight inch astrolabe. We're going to be taking that to the Willis Tower in Chicago and doing the Al Biruni measurement with it. Uh, one of several ways that we're going to do it this week, probably today or tomorrow. I have two wooden kits coming. One is a sextant or not not a sextant. One is an astrolabe, and uh, the second is an armillary sphere. And we're going to put those together, you know, on two different live shows. One, one for the one for the astrolabe, and the other one for the armillary sphere, because I think that watching them come together and seeing how they're constructed will give you a lot of insight to how they're used and what they can do. Now, this the astrolabe that I got is a more traditional sextant that has the standard backside to it, rather than the De Rojas uh, sextant. The universal sextant, and um, you'll see how that's work. That works. You know, you can do all sorts of cool things with that. You can measure the height of buildings and mountains and towers with it. Um, you can find the direction to Mecca. There's a lot of cool things. So, if you want, uh, there is a live chat going on over on Common Sense Science right now, and the Discord link is down on the bottom. I checked that last night to make sure that it's working. And you're welcome to come over there. I'll be over there in a couple of minutes, and I'll probably spend about an hour there. Getting a little missy, a uh, little bit of surgery today. Kind of like what Otis had, only only for only for little girls. And uh, so I'm going to kind of devote a little bit of time to her uh, later on this afternoon. So I'll see you guys later. Thanks again, everybody, and take care.